the title of this sermon is Conflicted, Wholehearted Devotion to God and Also Compromised, right? So we keep that in mind as we dive into this sermon. Uh, we're continuing our sermon series in the genealogy of Jesus, right? And we're looking at key characters that have preceded Christ, anticipating the birth of our Savior. A uh, quick recap, we first looked at Jesus being the son of Adam, showing God's salvation is for the whole world. We looked at how Jesus is the son of Abraham, that God intends to make him a global blessing through Christ. We looked at how Jesus is the son of David, that there is going to be a line in the, king, in the line of David whose kingdom will never end. Right? We looked at Jesus even as a son of Tamar, uh, and how Jesus is the one who will bring redemption and righteousness for us. Today, we're going to look at this other key name that's mentioned in the genealogy that is of Jehoshaphat. Uh, after the reign of David, King David, Solomon, his son, became king. And God promised to prosper him if only he would serve the Lord and seek him like his father. But Solomon had a womanizing problem right? He had 700 women, wives, and 300 concubines. And the scriptures specifically say, because of these, I mean, he engaged in these marriages um, as alliances, as a peace treaty type alliance with foreign countries. But part of what that deal meant was these foreign uh, wives would also bring their local deities with them. In fact, he ended up having to build altars of worship for all of these fertility deities, right? And so God's judgment came, but God's judgment did not come while he was alive. So it came after he was dead, just out of honor for David. And so the kingdom was divided. So we have the Northern kingdom, which is called Israel or Samaria where Jeroboam became king, J, while the southern kingdom, which became known as Judah, uh, was ruled by Solomon's son, Rehoboam, with an R. Sadly, there was not one good king in the northern kingdom, while the southern kingdom seemed to have a few good kings, Jehoshaphat being one of them. But you hear the indictment of God against these kings throughout first and second kings and first and second chronicles as you read you hear phrases like for example in first kings 15 speaking of abijah the son of rehoboam it says he committed all the sins his father had done before him his heart was not fully devoted to the lord his god as the heart of david his forefather had been notice what is god's complaint his heart was not fully devoted, this wholehearted devotion that is so important. One of the things that was kind of jarring for me uh, last week is when Tub uh, was preaching, he said, you know, I struggle with David. You know, I kind of don't like him. Do you remember when he said that? The first time I heard it, I thought, oh my gosh, you don't like David? Who doesn't like David? Right? And then he kind of said, well, because of his episode with Bathsheba, right? And even in the summary account in the Chronicles and the Kings of David's life, it says he was devoted to God. He was a wonderful, um, uh, oh, I'm realizing that I have to spotlight my video. Okay, so this is better. Uh, you know, even in all of the accomplishments that David did, one of the key problems for David was what? That he killed, engineered the murder of Uriah so that he could have Bathsheba, right? So, but the point is, none of these kings were wholeheartedly serving the Lord. So right after Rehoboam, we have Abijah, and then after Abijah, we get to Asa, Asa or Asa. In Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat, we are told in verse 11, Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord as his father David had done. He expelled the male shine prostitutes from the, land, uh, from the land and got rid of all the idols his ancestors had made. Although he did not remove the high places, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. Very interesting. Did you catch that? All these wonderful things. Then it says, 
although he did not remove the high places. What are the high places? It's the places for Baal and Asherah pole worship. What is Asherah pole? These are phallic symbols that were built as fertility deities, and so was Baal, the god of who could provide rain, so to speak, right? All of these places he left intact. But verse 14 says, but his heart was committed to the Lord all his life. There you see this conflicting report. And most of our calculations, we chalk Asa off as a good king. And we do the same thing with Jehoshaphat. He became king when he was 35 years old, and he ruled for 25, 25 years. And so let's look at this particular scripture that we read, right? It is... Um, uh, there, there, okay, so the other thing to keep in mind is there are two main places where the story of the kings gets recounted. It's in the first and second chronicles and the first and second kings. One quick point to keep in mind is that the kings, first and second kings, was written when Israel was in exile in Babylon, most likely. So this is probably in the 500s when most of this was written. While the chronicles was written after they came back from the exile and they were settling the land. So the kings, for example, are a lot more brutal in their indictment about the kings of the past because they're trying to explain to the people, you guys, listen, the reason why we are in exile, we lost everything, we've been, you know, we've experienced so much pain is not because God abandoned us, is because we disowned God, we disobeyed God, we left God. That's why we are recipients of this judgment, right? That's why, so the kings capture a lot more of the critique. The chronicles wrote after they settled, came back and settled, is a way for the chronicler to inspire hope, to say we are still a people. This is our history. This is our story. So for example, you don't really hear a big critique of David or Solomon in the chronicles, right? But you hear a strong critique in First Kings, like the Bathsheba, the adultery episode is not mentioned in the chronicles. But in, let us take a look now, zoom in on Jehoshaphat's life. In 2 Chronicles 17 is when Jehoshaphat comes into power. We're told, verse 3, the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the ways of his father David before him. He did not consult, consult the Baals. Verse 4 says, but sought the God of his father and followed his commands rather than the practice of Israel. His heart was devoted to the ways of the Lord. Furthermore, he removed the high places and the Asherah poles from Judah. Again, the summary of Jehoshaphat's life is, man, his heart was in the right place. He loved God with all his heart. Was he perfect? No, but his heart was fully devoted to him. And then you get to chapter 18, the passage that we read today. And here's where the problem starts, okay? Let's recount with the story. Jehoshaphat goes to Samaria, which is Northern Kingdom, to meet with Ahab. Now, you will remember Ahab was the uh, king who gave Elijah a really hard time. A few weeks a few weeks ago, when we were talking about provision, how Elijah had to run away from Ahab because Jezebel was going to kill him. He had to go to the widow of Zarephath. And that story, so he was fleeing Ahab. Ahab was a vile king. And he is a kingdom of the no king of the northern kingdom. And Jehoshaphat goes to the northern kingdom. And here, a conversation begins to happen about attacking Ramoth Gilead. Right? So he's saying, Ahab says, Jehoshaphat, will you join me as we go and attack Ramoth Gilead? And what does he say? I am, notice this phrase, I am as you are, and my people are your people. Right? And then he says, first, seek the counsel of the Lord. So King Ahab, of course, he's got 400 prophets of Baal and Asherah, all of them, he brings them in, and they all start to prophesy. They do their you know, various activities, and they are prophesying in singular voice. They're saying, we must go. The victory will be given to us. And so Jehoshaphat looks at this and says, guys, can't we seek the counsel of the Lord from a prophet of Yahweh? Can't we seek God's, the Lord's prophet? Not like these guys of Baal and Asherah and these personal prophets that you've hired. No. And they say, okay, there's this one guy, his name is Micaiah, Micaiah, and Ahab says, but I hate him because he doesn't say anything good about me, all right? 
And Jehoshaphat says, don't say like that, call him. So he comes and he prophesies. He first says, okay, you'll get victory. That's what you want to hear, right? But then he says, no, tell me the truth. What is God saying? So he prophesies and says, the sheep are going to be scattered across the mountains. It's like they're sheep without a shepherd. And then they're all going to return to their home in peace. But the point is, the shepherd is going to be struck. In other words, the king is going to be killed, right? So what happens now is that Ahab disguises himself and goes into the battle, not as the king. Jehoshaphat goes as the king into the battle. The enemies see Jehoshaphat as the king. They run toward him to kill him. But then as they come closer, they realize it's Jehoshaphat, not Ahab. So they let him go. But some soldier just happened to, you know, aim an arrow and fire it away. And it happened to pierce Ahab right between his armor and his flesh, it pierced right there in the gap and he bled to death, right? So herein you see this prophecy fulfilled. But first let's talk about the good things about Jehoshaphat. Here's the first thing. You see this quality that Jehoshaphat is famous for, right? It is that he seeks the Lord, he inquires of the Lord. In fact, this phrase, inquire of the Lord, just in the English phraseology, inquire of the Lord, appears at least 23 times in the Old Testament. And it is one of the most dominant themes in the life of David. When something would happen, he would go, let's go seek the Lord. Let's go inquire of the Lord. Should I go attack? Should I go fight? Should I go do this? He always sought the Lord. Here's my point. Jehoshaphat prioritized and valued seeking the voice of God. You see this again in chapter 17 of Second Chronicles. We introduced to his reign. 18 is where we are in. 19, he returns from this battle. But then in 20, you see this other very famous chapter about Jeho Jehoshaphat's life. It is that he's surrounded by enemies. His back is against the wall and he cries out to God, right? In chapter 20. And he says, he prays and he says, God, we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. You remember this? It's the famous prayer that he prays. And then the Lord speaks. He says, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Right? And of course, you know the rest of the story, right? God comes through for them. They lead out and they basically win the battle because God is on their side. It's this aspect of inquiring of the Lord. Psalm 27, David says this way, Lord, I seek your face. My heart says, seek your face. And I say, my, your face, Lord, I will seek, right? What does it mean to seek the Lord? What does it mean to inquire of the Lord? You know, one of the biggest compliments that God gives in the Old Testament is the compliment that says, he fears the Lord, right? What does that mean? that he reverences the Lord, that he or she makes decisions by honoring me, by seeking me, asking me, God, what do you think? What is your will? So here's what seeking the Lord means, my friends. First, it is talking about a posture of listening, posture of listening, which is coming to God with a heart that says, God, you speak. I want to hear I want to live my life according to what you say. I want to listen, Lord, right? That's the first posture. It's allowing his will to direct our paths and our steps. But secondly, it's this posture of prioritizing, right? God, prior, it's not just listening, but it's prioritizing God's will and God's perspective. And lastly, it is a posture of valuing God's voice, right? All of those three things are connected, but it's not all the same as we will see in Jehoshaphat's life, you can listen them, but not obey. It's listening, prioritizing, and then valuing, saying, this is what I should live my life by, right? But here's the challenge. Jehoshaphat had the courage to inquire, but he lacked the courage to follow through in all areas of his life. Let me say that again. It is one thing for us to inquire the will of God, but it is another to actually follow it. Think about it. In chapter 18, if this is exactly what Micaiah had prophesied, here's my question. Jehoshaphat, 
dude, what are you doing going into battle? If that was the word of the Lord, we're going to get to this in a second. What in the world are you doing with Ahab? Right? And you don't really see, I mean, remember this kind of history and uh, retelling of what happened, kind of just hear the facts. So you don't really see him struggle. Should I go? Should I not? He doesn't try to convince Ahab, Ahab, we shouldn't go into this battle. You don't see that conversation in that story. They go out and Ahab gets killed. And so then we're told Jehoshaphat somehow escapes. He returns back to the safety of his palace. And then we're told in 2 Chronicles chapter 19, in verse 1, it says, When Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, returned safely to his palace in Jerusalem, Jehu, the seer, the prophet, the son of Hanani, went out to meet him and said to the king, Listen, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Oh, oh. Man. This is the discipline of the Lord. You know, it's the grace of God that speaks to us like this. We, man, we know better. Yet, we go places, do things, and then God sends a prophet like Nathan, put his finger in David's face. And in this story, Jehu, let me read the rest of it. Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, the wrath of the Lord is on you. There is, however, some good news. Good, no, no. Verse 3 says, there is, however, some good in you. For you have rid the land of the Asherah poles and have set your heart on seeking God. Do you see this? A really conflicted personality, right? There's so much good in him. And yet, man, he does not follow through. Here's how chapter 18, the verses that we read started. If you remember in verse 18, I'm gonna, let me put this back on the screen so you can see this. In chapter 18, this starts with this verse. In verse 1, now Jehoshaphat had great wealth because of the favor of God. All these people started giving him money and honor. But look at this. And he allied himself with Ahab by marriage. And some years later, he went down to see Ahab in Samaria. That phrase. You know, first we're told Jehoshaphat aligns with the wicked king Ahab by marriage. So Jehoshaphat's son, Jehoram, married Ahab and Jezebel's daughter. And marriages, of course, in this era was a way in which kings sought alliances and established peace treaties, right? But in Ahab's case, here's what the Bible says about Ahab. In 1 Kings chapter 16, I'm going to read you verse 30 to 33. It says, Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. Do you see the indictment? And you hear and you begin to see a couple of the problems, right? Why is this guy with Ahab? Why is he marrying his son to his daughter? And after God has spoken, why have you gone to the battle? But here's the problem. It happens again. It is not a once and done. In 2 Kings chapter 3, after Ahab dies, his son comes into power. The kingdom of Moab neighboring kingdom, fails to pay their dues to the king of Israel, Joram, Ahab's son. So he comes to Jehoshaphat and says, hey, will you go to war with me against this king of Moab? And 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 7, here's what Jehoshaphat says, I will go with you. I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horse. 
Do you see? The same phrase that he spoke to his father, he is now speaking to the son, but he added a little bit, which is what? He's saying, my horses are also your horses. Right? He's going deeper and deeper in this entrenchment. And again, while on the way, he stops and says, let us call a prophet to inquire the will of God. So you see this, like, I'm going to do this, but I'm also going to see God. So here's the question, like, why is a godly king colluding with an evil king? And here's how Second Chronicles 20 wraps up the story of Jehoshaphat. I'm going to read this for us, and then I'll offer a couple of thoughts, right? Here's how the scriptures read in verse 32. Jehoshaphat followed the ways of his father Asa and did not stray from them. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. The high places, however, were not removed, and the people still had not set their hearts on the God of their ancestors. Right? The same problem with King Asa, he did also with Jehoshaphat. And he made an alliance with Amaziah, then king of Israel. After this guy died, he made, it was another king, Amaziah. He made an alliance with him to build ships, right? But the prophet said, because you made an alliance with Ahaziah, the Lord will destroy what you have made. This is how that chapter 20 concludes. Jehoshaphat's life, good guy, but man, he keeps making these deals. And secondly, you notice that when he had the power to make the difference and change and destroy the idolatry and the false gods, he wasn't able to. He did some, but he wasn't able to just like his father Asa. And probably because by now, why? His son is married to Jezebel's daughter. Jezebel is from Sidon. Sidon is the capital of Baal worship, right? So it's in his family. He can't get rid of it. And sadly, as you trace the following kings, this pattern has made a tremendous impact on his children. Jehoshaphat's son Jehoram became king, and he killed all his other brothers. And then in 2 Chronicles 21 verse 4, it says, When Jehoram established himself firmly over his father's kingdom, he put all his brothers to the sword along with some of the officials. Jehoram was 32 when he became king and reigned for eight years. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel, northern kingdom, as the house of Ahab had done, for he married a daughter of Ahab, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And then right after him, same thing happens with his son Amaziah. We're talking about, we just traced four generations, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, and Amaziah, all of them failing to get rid of the idolatry in the land. You know, Jehoshaphat's life shows us that you can be an overall a good king and yet make some serious compromises that have lasting consequences. So my question to you, my friends, is this. Where do you feel drawn to make compromises and accommodations? Right? The life of Jehoshaphat shows, on the one hand, the priority and the desire to inquire the will of God, but it's also the tendency to make compromises, showing that the practice of inquiring of the Lord did not translate to all areas of life. It only remained in certain areas. And interestingly, what, you, what this shows us is this, and I love the scriptures for this reason. First, we do not see perfect people in the Bible. Hence, we should be careful of our tendency to idolize people. I love the Bible for this reason. It doesn't just give you great stories about how everybody is good and wonderful. No, you hear some real challenges with these people. And that's why, first, you do not meet perfect people. And therefore, we should guard our tendency to idolize people. Secondly, what you see is the grace of God in choosing and using weak vessels, imperfect vessels. And third, deeper still, is that God's grace chooses to use us despite our failures 
and the mistakes of our past and the mistakes of our future. If anything, from what, what we've learned from the last few weeks, of course, from Judah and Tamar and from David's story, is that God uses people that are imperfect. That gives me a little bit of hope, amen? My friends, the only person perfect is born on Christmas Day. That is who we long for and, the, and we await that perfect king, the one who rules with righteousness, the one who does the will of God, the one throughout the scriptures, you hear this, he's after my heart, but, but there was this issue or they totally rejected me. But the one that is perfect, who does the will of the father is the one who prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. And you hear this in Psalm 40, right? Psalm 40, David, the king prays. He said, here I am. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. These are sacrifices you haven't desired, but I have come to do your will. And this is the same verse that the Hebrews writer uses in Hebrews 10 to speak of the perfect sacrifice of Christ, how Christ came as that perfect sacrifice to do the will of God, right? So my friends, the only one perfect that is a king that we long for, the one who, is, who was to come and the one who has come in Christ. And it is in him and in his righteousness that you and I have hope. My friends, I do not have hope in my perfection. I do not have hope that I will never fail. <laughs> you can ask you this. <laughs> uh, I, I fail plenty, right? But my hope is that because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, when God looks at me, he looks at me in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that my past is forgiven, anything that I could possibly do, and all of the opportunities that God will give me to, free, uh, to repent, all of that is covered under the blood of Christ. When we put our faith in Christ, not because of our perfection, but because of Jesus' perfection, we say, you are the righteous one. When we receive his righteousness, it cleanses us and washes us and places us in right standing with God. My friends, we realize by looking at the life of Jehoshaphat that we are also capable of doing incredible good, but also making incredibly poor decisions and choices that impact others and impact multiple generations. That's why, my friends, we cry out to God and we say, God, you are the righteous one. It is you that we rely on. It is you that is worthy, and you are the only one worthy of our affection. Amen. So I don't know if you look in the mirror and you see a conflicted person. But there's hope for you and for me because of Jesus. Amen? We're going to go into a time of communion now. And I'm going to invite you to um, hold your uh, piece of bread and juice as we transition into this time. But I'm going to pray before we dive into that. All right? I'm going to invite you to hold that and then let's pray together. Lord, I'm just so grateful, Lord, that you send your prophets into our lives. You send godly people our way. Lord, we keep thinking of that verse that Sandy shared. It's the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. So, Lord, we thank you that it is your love and your grace that woos us back to you. It is your kindness that puts good people in our path asks us questions. And so, Lord, we pray that you please help us, Lord. We don't want to have areas of compromise in our lives. We want to have lives of wholehearted devotion to you. And when we fail and when we falter, we thank you that we can rely on you, Lord, our Savior, Jesus, the perfect righteous one. So, Lord, we trust you and we hope in you. In Jesus' name, amen.